If your life is complete chaos and you are deeply unhappy, you have sort of spiritual emptiness as just sitting down and being alone with your thoughts. At some point in your life, someone probably told you, enjoy every moment. Life is short. Maybe you've smiled and rolled your eyes at this well-intentioned relative or co-worker, but the fact is, there's something to it. Trying to enjoy each moment may actually be good for your health. The idea is called mindfulness. This ancient practice is about being completely aware of what's happening in the present, of all that's going on inside and all that's happening around you. It means not living your life on autopilot. Instead, you experience life as it unfolds moment to moment, good and bad, and without judgment or preconceived notions. Studies suggest that mindfulness practices may help people manage stress, cope better with serious illness, and reduce anxiety and depression. Many people who practice mindfulness report an increased ability to relax, a greater enthusiasm for life, and improved self-esteem. At dawn, when you have trouble getting out of bed, tell yourself, I have to go to work as a human being. What do I have to complain of if I'm going to do what I was born for? The things I was brought into the world to do? Or is this what I was created for? To huddle under the blankets and stay warm? Marcus Aurelius We are more often frightened than hurt, and we suffer more in imagination than in reality. Seneca Once Buddha said, What you think, you become. What you feel, you attract. What you imagine, you create. Buddhism and Stoicism share much in common, whilst also having enough differences to give the practitioner versed in one tradition pause for reflection when encountering the other. Both Stoicism and Buddhism, especially in their more contemporary engaged and non-renunciant forms, are highly pragmatic philosophies with a focus on the here and now. Marcus Aurelius, Emperor of the Roman Empire, 161, 180 AD, whose private philosophical diary The Meditation Survives, writes that each man only lives in this present instant. All the rest either has been lived or remains in uncertainty. So too, Vich Nhat Han, one ought to be aware that we are here and now, and the only moment to be alive is the present moment. The advice Marcus Aurelius gives himself will resonate with the Buddhist practitioner. Every hour, focus your mind attentively on the performance of the task in hand with dignity, human sympathy, benevolence, and freedom, and leave aside all other thoughts. You will achieve this if you perform each action as if it were your last. In this context, it is not surprising that within Stoicism, something strongly akin to mindfulness holds a central place. Do you not realize that when once you have let your mind go wandering, it is no longer in your power to recall it, to bring it back to what is right, to self-respect, to moderation? The importance of cultivating a focused mind in Stoicism is reminiscent of the Buddha's saying in the Dhammapada that not a mother, not a father will do so much. A well-directed mind will do us greater service. That something so similar to mindfulness was central to what it took to be a Stoic is inherently fascinating. But hang on a minute, you might say. The Stoics did not have anything like sitting meditation, anchoring awareness in sensations, or focusing on the breath. Their version of mindfulness can't be all that similar to Buddhist mindfulness, can it? Indeed, what we might call Stoic mindfulness is something with its own distinctly Stoic purposes. So what is it that makes Stoic mindfulnesses distinctively Stoic? Stoic mindfulnesses pro soci is concerned with cultivating the ability to apply key ethical precepts to everyday situations. The most important one was to ensure that you are focusing on what you can control and not on what you can't control and more precisely, focusing on doing what you can control in ways which befit a benevolent social being, we'll explore this aspect a bit more further. 
As regards the first aspect, a key question someone practicing Stoic mindfulness might ask themselves, therefore, would be, where am I placing myself in this situation? Am I placing myself in something I cannot control, or am I placing myself in what I can control? The difference between the two can be subtle, though the implications profound. Let's take an example from the workplace. If you place yourself in your manager's approval, something which is outside of your control, then you will be happy when she does approve and deflated when she does not. Your work is performed with her approval as your main aim. As a Stoic, you would approach the situation differently, asking yourself, what is up to me in this situation? Up to me would be to focus on doing my job well and calmly, for example. Also up to me would be maintaining the relationship with my manager as well as possible, even if what the manager herself thinks of me is not up to me. Of course, if the manager is happy, then that is something to be glad about, but that was never the main reason for setting about my work. I set about it as a craft in its own right. I did the work in order to do the work well. Epictetus gives us another example, that of a singer with stage fright. When I see man in anxiety, I say to myself, what can it be that this fellow wants? For if he did not want something that was outside of his control, how could he still remain in anxiety? That is why when singing on his own, he shows no anxiety, but does so what he enters the theater, even though he has a beautiful voice. For he does not wish merely to sing well, but also to win applause, and that is no longer under his control. Why is this? Why, he simply does not know what a crowd is, or the applause of a crowd. Hence he trembles and turn pale. The singer's volition is placed in wanting the crowd to applaud him. If it does, he leaves all puffed up. If it doesn't, more deflation. The Stoic singer, in contrast, focuses just on the performance of his art and doing that well. He will be glad if the crowd applauds, but that was never the point of his singing. The same could apply to giving a presentation or speech. The irony, of course, is that the one who focuses on the performance of his art, on being in the zone, is more likely to do his or her task well and to win the applause of the crowd. In short, a basic stoic mindfulness practice might be to ask yourself at different points throughout the day, where am I placing myself in this situation? If, Epictetus told his students, you find that your thoughts are investing themselves in things you cannot control, remember to say to yourself, that has nothing to do with me. This is akin to a gentle monitoring of the self, a gradual sharpening of agency towards what you can do and doing it well. Stoic mindfulness, stoic selfishness. But another objection might be that stoic mindfulness leads to selfishness, to just focusing on what I'm doing without any thought to what anyone else thinks or feels. But this could not be further from what the Stoics were trying to achieve. For what is up to me as a rational social being is actually to keep trying to place myself in the good, which is virtue and something naturally benefiting. And the good manifests in particular in my relationships with others. And according to the Stoics, relationships can really flourish only when someone places himself or herself in the good. In Buddhism, me and mine are often rightly seen as problematic, leading to grasping and craving. In Stoicism, in contrast, me and mine are problematic only when they are placed either in things you can't control or if placed in things you can control which are bad. Therefore, me and mine are not problematic in Stoicism when they are placed both in what is in someone's power and in the intention to be good. Epictetus explains this as follows. For where one can say I and mine, to there will the human being incline. If I and mine are placed in the flesh, there will the human being's ruling power be. If they are in the moral purpose, there must it be. If they are in externals, there must it be. If therefore I am where my moral purpose is, then and then only will I be the friend and son and father that I should be. For then, this will by interest, to keep my good faith, my self-respect, my forbearance, my co-cooperation, 
and to maintain my relationships with other human beings. In Stoicism, the selfish ego is slowly replaced with the altruistic one. What is up to me is to be kind, generous, philanthropic. The reasons for this stem from Stoicism's observations of nature. They strongly believe that human beings by nature were shaped for cooperation, to live in society, and to raise families. So, if we really are to fulfill our nature as social beings, it will be up to us to embody care and compassion for others. As Marcus writes, For we are made for cooperation, like feet, like hands, like eyelids, like the rows of the upper and lower teeth. To act against one another is contrary to nature. Indeed, the ideal of what is ultimately up to us then is actually a kind of altruistic flow, captured beautifully in this passage, again by Marcus. Like the vine that produces its grapes, seeking nothing more once it has given forth its fruit. So the good man, having done one deed well, does not shout it about, but turns to the next good deed, just like the vine turns to bear forth its fruit in due season. So there is more to what is up to us in Stoicism than meets the eye. Stoic mindfulness is really about seeing what is up to you in any given situation, focusing on doing that well and on doing the act with kindness towards others. It is from the Stoics indeed that the ideal of a community of humankind first stems. Furthermore, a 2nd century AD Stoic called Hierocles developed a spiritual exercise, ascesis, very similar to Meta's practice, in which you consciously drew your circles of relationships closer to yourself, a practice in many ways analogous to Buddhist loving-kindness practice. On this area of similarity, it would seem fitting to end, as it is at the heart of the matter for both systems. So, in the words, first of Seneca and then the Buddha, no philosophy is kinder or more lenient, more philanthropic or attentive to the common good. The Buddha was once asked by a leading disciple, would it be true to say that a part of our training is for the development of love and compassion? The Buddha replied, no, it would not be true to say this. It would be true to say that the whole of our training is for the development of love and compassion. You know, like I think what this sort of this solitude and silence and reflecting time is supposed to help us do, whether we are doing it in the Buddhism way or the Stoicism way, you just need to develop self-control discipline and self-awareness. Then you can achieve mindfulness. Thank you for watching is the one of the Stoicism teaching which give us the ability to be more kind and calm because a calm mind can achieve mindfulness and mental awareness. Give your thoughts on comment and subscribe the channel for your growth and mental stability. Stay tuned for more valuable content.